So coming to the special sense that is olfaction, it is the sensation of smell. So whenever there is an olfact olfactory defect, it is called as anosmia. If there is hyperosmia can be there where they are called as good smellers and or else parosmia also can be there like altered sensation of smell. So how olfaction is transmitted to the brain? So from the olfactory epithelium, there is a bipolar olfactory neurons. This bipolar olfactory neurons is present in the spermous part of the nose and they sense the impulses. From there, they will pass through the cribriform plate and they will reach the olfactory bulb. From there, they will directly go to the olfactory cortex. What is one thing missing in here? Usually everything goes to the thalamus. Here it does not go to the thalamus. Here it directly goes to the olfactory cortex. So the exception here is it is not passing through the thalamus. Thalamus not involved. But recent study says that thalamus is involved which we already discussed previously also. Thalamus is not involved. But still for our MCQ this we consider that it is the olfaction that which does not go to the thalamus. Then finally it reaches three different places. That is the orbitofrontal cortex, then amygdala, then enterorhinal cortex. All three have different functions with respect to olfaction. First coming to the or orbitofrontal cortex, what it does is, it is the conscious discrimination. The conscious discrimination of various different kinds of smell is done with the help of orbitofrontal cortex. We are able to differentiate between a rose and a, a gutter which is not smelling nicely. So this differentiation happens in the orbitofrontal cortex. Then coming to amygdala, amygdala is involved in emotional. So the emotional aspect, emotional aspect of olfaction is done with the help of this amygdala. Then coming finally to the enterorhinal cortex, enterorhinal cortex is for the olfactory memories which we saw it in the limbic system also. It is for the olfactory memories. The, the memories that are related to smell are stored in the enterorhinal cortex. So it has three different representation in the cerebral cortex. Then coming to the receptors of olfaction, the olfactory receptors are G protein coupled receptors. And what is the ion responsible for it? That is very important. The calcium ions are the ones which is responsible for this olfactory or the odorant, odorant transmission. So this is all about olfaction. Now coming to the second part that is gustation. Gustation means it is the taste sensation. So there are two groups of receptors. So for the five primary tastes, which is salt, sour, sweet, bitter, and now umami is also added. So there are five basic tastes. Out of that, two of them are ligand-gated channels. Like they are ligand-gated ionotropic receptors. They are ion channels. Whereas the rest three are the metabotopic receptors or G-protein coupled receptors. So we have to remember all the receptors in it. Some of them have been asked previously also. So we have to remember all the receptors. Coming to the salt, it has a specific receptor which is called as ENAC. In our renal system also, we will be discussing the same channel. It is called as epithelial sodium channel. This is ENAC channels or epithelium sodium channels. Then coming to the sour taste, it also has ENAC channels. The ENAC channels can sense them. At the same time, there are other channels also like the H plus channels, like the proton pump channels can also sense the sore taste. And finally, the HCN. This channel again in the cardiac system, which will be discussed. This H channel is hyperpolarization activated cyclic AMP nucleotide channel. We will discuss again detailedly in the case of cardiovascular system. Then finally, the sweet taste. The sweet taste, the GPCRs, they have different type of transient receptors. The sweet taste passes through the T1, R2 and T1, R3. R1 and R2 of the T1 family will go to the sweet. It is producing a intermediate which is gustudusin. Then coming to the bitter taste, it is transported through the G GPCR which is T2R. This is for one goes here, then two comes to the bitter taste. Then for umami, there are two important receptors T1, R1 and T1, R3. These are the two important. But other than that, there is one more receptor which has been asked in MCQ that is very important. Here they have asked, umami is transmitted through which type of receptor? And the uh, option given was M glu R. What is this M glu R? This is nothing but monosodium glutamate. It is the composition which is present in the Chinese food and in South, South Asian foods. That is like Ajinomoto also has, has this M glu uh, substance that is monosodium glutamate receptors. So the full form for this is monosodium glutamate receptors, monosodium glutamate. Then coming to the next sensation that is hearing. 
here in it in it will be extensively discussed in the ENT but some of the RMP levels and endocochlear potential we have to know. So the hearing part has two hair cells. One is the outer hair cell, another one is the inner hair cell. Out of this, the modulation of sound is done with the help of outer hair cells. Whereas the transducers or the hearing or the sensors are done with the help of inner hair cells. So that is the difference between these two. Now coming to the RMP of these hair cells, their RMP is at minus 60 also and minus 150 also. But we have to see what is the question asked. Whenever it is compared to the peri limb, peri limb it is the outer limb which is present. So this peri limb, whenever it is compared, it is minus 60 millivolt. Whenever the RMP is compared with the endo limb, it is minus 150 millivolt. And there are some specialized channels which is called as the tip links. So what happens whenever we are hearing the sound? The hair cells will move towards the highest one that is kinocilium. The hair cells will move towards it and what will happen? There is a tip link present. So whenever there is a tip link, there will be a stretch of it and this mechanosensitive stretch, mechanical stretch, otherwise we can say it is a mechanical stretch. What will happen is it is going to, it is going to open up the channels and the neurotransmitters that is going to enter, enter are the calcium and potassium. So this channel group is called as the tip link. So whenever this channels, there is entry of ions, what is going to happen? There should be a release of neurotransmitter through which the potential can be carried out. The neurotransmitter released here is glutamate. The neurotransmitter released in this scenario is glutamate. So this is important. And there is one more important potential called as the endocochlear potential. What is this endocochlear potential? This is the potential between the endolymph and the perilymph. We are comparing the endolymph and perilymph potential. Whenever this potential was seen, it was seen to be positive. It was around mine plus 80 millivolt. It was a positivity. Usually we don't see the potentials to be positive at baseline itself. There was positivity in the scalar media. Then what is the reason for this positivity? If there is positivity, it means that there is an excess of ion channels which is positive. So here what happens is there is a potassium ion increased secretion. There is continuous secretion of potassium ions from one place. That place is called as stria vascularis. Because of this potassium secretion, what happens is there is positivity of the endocochlear potential. Potassium secretion from stria vascularis. So these are the some of the important potential with respect to that of a hearing. Now coming to the vision. So the refractive errors are very important. The normal vision is called as emetropia. And coming to a person who is having short-sightedness. Short-sightedness, most of us are wearing specs. Like off our age, there will be a myopia. So what is the issue with this? Whenever we are able to see a nearby object, it is visible. But far off objects are not visible. So the basic problem in this condition is the eyeballs of the subjects are usually larger. There is a usually large eyeball is present. So because of this, what will happen? Whatever rays is entering the eyes, they are focusing in front of the retina. So see here, they are focusing in front of the retina. So what is the solution for this? We have to diverge the rays and send it at the back of the retina. So what type of lens we should use? We should use a concave mirror, the concave type of lens. So suppose whenever we are using a concave mirror like this, what is going to happen? The rays which are entering now, they will get diverged and finally they can be focused in the retina. So this kind of focusing can happen. So once it hits here, it moves above, then finally it will be joined in the retina. So this kind of focus which is, which is concave lens can do is the divergence of rays and finally focusing at a far point. Since our, our primary image is already forming in front of the retina, we have to focus it behind. Then coming to hypermetropia or a farsightedness. It is just the opposite of that. What happens there is the image is focused behind the retina. So the rays will be hitting the retina like this and the image will be focused behind the retina. So what we have to do? We have to converge the rays much earlier. So what is the type of lens that will be preferred? The type of lens that will be preferred is convex mirror. We have to use a convex mirror like this. So the mirror used will be a convex mirror so that the rays can be focused at a much earlier point where the retina is present. So this type of uh, mirror used is called as convex mirror. Now coming to the photoreceptors. 
photo receptors all of us know it are, there are two types of photo receptors one is for the dark vision or the scotopic vision like whenever you are seeing the objects in the dark dark it is called a scotopic vision and it is done with the help of rods whereas cones cones is for the color vision cones is for the color vision and it is called as photopic vision now coming to the visual cycle this is very important this visual cycle we have to know all the important components from it so starting from it this is the photopigment which is present that is called rhodopsin then whenever any light energy is falling on it suppose you are seeing the light what is going to happen it is getting converted to a form called as batho rhodopsin from batho rhodopsin it will be converted to lumi rhodopsin then finally it will be converted to meta rhodopsin 1 and followed by meta rhodopsin 2 this meta rhodopsin 2 is the most important component so this is the most active form of active form of what active form of rhodopsin so it means that whenever rhodopsin reaches this stage it becomes active so meta rhodopsin will get split into scotopsin scotopsin and 11 trans retinal it is an al not ol ol is a vitamin a so this 11 trans retinal can form isomerization with 11 trans retinol this retinol should be constantly supplied with the help of vitamin a that's why whenever there is a vitamin a deficiency what happens is there is a light it starts with night blindness so first it starts with night blindness and it is one of the most common cause of visual deficiency in developing countries so this is the most common cause then this 11 trans retinol also can form 11 cis retinol and this retinal part can get converted to 11 cis retinal so when 11 cis retinal along with scotopsin is available what can they form they can again form the rhodopsin they can again form the rhodopsin so as and when we enter darkness what will happen more and more rhodopsin can be formed so more and more sensitivity can be improved because this is continuously formed with the with the mixture of scotopsin and 11 cis retinal so this reaction is constantly happening now coming to the photo transduction now light is hitting meta rhodopsin is produced so what will happen normally during the dark so normally during the dark when light is not available there is a sodium potassium channel in the rods as well as in the cones this is called as the outer segment and this is called as the inner segment what will happen there will be a reflex of sodium to the outside and this sodium can enter this internal segment also as well as the outer segment also and finally they will release the neurotransmitter this is very fascinating because whenever there is a neurotransmitter release the signal transduction will happen but in the retina it is completely opposite that's why we have to understand clearly so whenever there is a light what is going to happen this channel is getting blocked this channel is getting blocked but how we are able to see this neurotransmitter release is reduced and this release of neurotransmitter reduction will be sensed by the bipolar cells and they will transport the impulses obviously they are going to produce the neurotransmitter from them bipolar cells are going to produce it but what is the sense for the bipolar cells the reduction in neurotransmitter release from the rods and cones will activate the bipolar cells and finally this activation of bipolar cells will be carried on to the visual pathway and they will finally reach the cortex so coming to the visual pathway more than the visual pathway the lesions in the visual pathway is very very important so this is the visual pathway so once it starts here one part of the eye is focusing on the temporal field another part is focusing on the nasal field so their fibers will cross over and from them it is going to take away so what will happen it will be first carried in the optic nerve then followed by the optic chiasma then the optic tract and finally the optic radiation this black one which is reaching the visual uh, which is reaching the cortex is called as optic radiation so this is optic radiation so now we are going to see what happens whenever there is a lesion at various different places so first coming to the section a so what we are trying to do we are trying to cut the optic nerve itself so section a is nothing but the optic nerve is cut optic nerve itself is cut so whenever optic nerve itself is cut we are cutting on the this is a, this is the left side this is the right side what is going to happen just trace back the fibers both the visual uh, visual impulses from the right side they are complete left side is completely caught so there will be a left side 
anopia. There will be a left side anopia. In a similar manner, if it is cut on the right side, it is going to cause right side anopia. Because they have not crossed, once they cross in the optic chiasma, then only they are going to change their track. As you can see here, whenever they are crossing in the optic chiasma, which fibers are crossing? The fibers which are seeing the temporal field is crossing. The fibers which are seeing the temporal field is crossing to the opposite side. So it will cross to the opposite side and it will reach the medial lateral geniculate body of the opposite side. In the same manner, the other thing also will happen. The nasal part will be focusing the temporal region and the temporal part will be focusing the nasal region. Now coming to the second lesion, second lesion we are cutting, this B is being cut at the level of optic chiasma. So what will happen? Let's understand. Optic chiasma. I told you the optic chiasma crossing over happens for the temporal field of vision. Now all this defect is represented in the field of vision. We are not representing in the eye or in the track. We are representing in the field of vision. Suppose whenever there is a lesion in optic chiasma, we are going to understand which type, which field of vision is affected. So first thing is whenever optic chiasma is cut, just trace it back. It is going to the nasal side of the retina. And this nasal side, I told you, it will be visualizing the temporal field. So it is visualizing the temporal field. So what will happen? This side nasal fibers also are crossed. That side nasal fibers is crossing it. Now both are gone. Both were focusing the two temporal sides. So this side temporal vision also will be gone. This side temporal side vision also will be gone. So what is that called as? This optic chiasma will be asked in questions. So what is that called? It is called as bitemporal both sides, both sides temporal vision is lost by temporal hemianopia. Both the eyes are able to, uh, were not able to see the temporal vision and it is causing a half vision in the temporal field. And we can say that in this what is happening, one field of vision is lost in one direction, another field of vision is lost in another direction. That's why there is an another name for this by temporal hemianopia, which is called as heteronemous hemianopia. It is called as hetero nemus hemianopia then coming to the other one which is third lesion the third lesion they are trying to do it in the optic tract so what will happen in the optic tract in the optic tract the laser fibers which was focusing the temporal field of the other side and the temporal fibers which was focusing the nasal region of this side will be gone so the shaded areas as you can see here this side temporal is gone opposite side temporal is gone same side nasal field is gone so what is happening here is when I'm seeing, when I'm fixing my eyes, this side temporal is gone, this side nasal is gone. So this part of the image, whichever is coming from one same place is gone. So what is go going to happen whenever there is a lesion in optic tract? Whenever there is a lesion in optic tract, what is going to happen is there will be a homonemus. Now it is obstructing the vision from the same side. Homonemus hemianopia. It is called as homonemus hemianopia because same side visual field is affected. Now coming to the last lesion which is the optic radiation, the lesion in the optic radiation. Optic radiation is very similar to that of the optic tract. The only thing is in the optic radiation, some of the macular fibers, they have bilateral representation also. At the same time, they have a different representation in the cortex. So there will be a homonemus hemianopia only. But as you can see in the diagram also, there is a small gap which is given here. So what is going to happen? It is going to cause homonemus hemianopia with what is going to be spat? The macular fibers. The image from the macula is going to be spat. Macular sparing. So that is going to happen. So this is all about the various visual pathway lesions. Please remember, it is always the field that is represented, that is damaged, that is going to be given. Don't think of the retina or the retinal fibers. Just always trace back the track and see which side of the visual field is gone. If same side visual field is gone, like we saw it in optic track, it is called as homonemus hemianopia. If different side visual tract is gone, visual field is gone, then we call it as heteronemus hemianopia. I hope it's clear.